What's happening, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 19, the official Voyager 3 podcast. Happy Halloween, everybody. We have a fun episode ahead talking about some cool horror stuff, some spooky stuff. Um, so let's get right into it, guys. How's it going? Happy Halloween. <laughs> That's right. How much candy oh my How much candy did you get? What's going on with Aaron? <laughs> I, I got a lot of candy. You got a lot of candy. <laughs> Man, I got three three quarters of a pillowcase full of candy. Y'all remember that? Uh, I got all almond joys. Oh man, uh, nice. Man, good. That's one that of my good. favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I got all. That's it. Well, speaking of candy and eating stuff, I got to know what are y'all drinking to wash this candy down with? <laughs> uh, I'm in the spirit of the season. Samuel Adams Oktoberfest. Oh, it's the man. spookiest of beers. Oh, yeah. Dig it. Yeah, it's got the right color combo and everything. Mm-hmm. All cool. right, Aaron. I see. I see you. You see me. I've I've been coming correct the last bunch of these. Yeah. I want to you're, you. you're getting better. You're getting better. <laughs> you're making improvements. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bring in some quality content. Yep. All right. What do you got? Right. What Let's Steve go next. <laughs> All right. I got something new and fun and different too. It's uh it's from Germany. It's called uh Klaus Toller. And it and what? it's uh it's this an alcohol. Klaus <laughs> it's it's isn't that how you say it? Klaus. I don't know. What is it? It's an yeah, alcohol free grapefruit drink. Sweet. Bottled yeah. in Germany. So I I was uh inspired from that couple episodes ago that, that fever tree grapefruit that I had. So this is yeah. another one that's like that. I probably maybe people use it for a mixer. I don't know, but there's no twist. So check it out. Ready? Oh yeah. There's yes. that ASMR that everybody likes. Yeah. See, Greg, remember at the rehearsal you got me that thing that's like an alcohol-free beer that was well, wasn't it hoppy, right? Is that what yeah. it was? Well, you're yeah. talking about the the hot tea. The tea. Yeah, hot tea. Yeah, the tea. The tea. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's good. Cheers. Nice. Steve right. coming with the weird it's drink. Man. Grapefruity, man. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Very cool. All the way from Germany. All right, yeah. Greg, what you got? Well, it's that time of year in Michigan. Oh, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Top slam time, man. Hey, Greg, now I know that's one of your absolute favorites. And when it becomes the fall time in Michigan, you stock up on that stuff, man. You order an, yep. extra, an extra case. It's only once a year that they put it out. And, uh, has a three month shelf life. So you got to go get it while you can find it and then drink it fast. Right on. Oh, are you, are you talking about the can itself has a three month shelf life? We're talking about they only have it around for three months. No, I mean like the, the drink itself. They, they say you shouldn't let it age too long. Oh, I did not know that. Huh. All right. But it's a double IPA. So you got to be careful. That's right. It's strong. It's a strong yeah. one. It's strong, like strong J. And I'm <laughs> drinking it. I'm drinking it out of my Coonan's brewery glass. Shout out to Brett Coonan and his brother. So yeah, it's hop slam season. If you don't know what that is, look up Bell's Brewery. As we said earlier, happy Halloween to everybody. Thanks for listening to us on Halloween. Maybe you're listening to us as your kids trick or treat, or maybe you're done trick or treating and you're unwinding, or maybe this is during the day before you go trick or treating. Maybe they're naked. Oh, well, I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> anything's That's possible. Weird. I wouldn't Steve rule covered, it out. Steve covered a lot of ground, and I just wanted to add. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to bring you something that we've been waiting for for a long time. We talked about it on an earlier episode of V3Cast, and it's finally out. It's Guillermo de Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities on Netflix. And I'm going to tell you what, I've watched seven of the eight of them and i love holy it holy cow Steve. i love it watch? it's Where did so you find the time? good late <laughs> at night man late at night absolutely outstanding they're sophisticated they they're all the production looks great nothing looks cheap it's just very clean written stories yeah. that are executed perfectly all the directors brought their a game and i gotta say panos cosmatos is one which is called um the viewing is off the chain it was everything dude. i wanted it to be oh my dude God. Do ooh, ooh. it's Panos. I mean, I the, 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 the guy is a genius, man. It, it's like, I see once I realized that they weren't uh, connected, I because I watched the first episode with uh, Tim Blake Nelson, that was great. Yeah. And then uh, I was like, I don't have time to watch all these before we do the podcast. 
but I'm going to watch Panos. So I just watched it like a half hour ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was, at, yeah, like you said, everything you could want from him, the colors, the cinematography, yep. the dialogue, the music, it was the, that guy is just, he's a genius. I know oh, yeah. he's only done two movies and a short film, but he's a genius. I can't wait to see everything he ever does and oh, just yeah. be there forever and have all of his stuff in the collection. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and so later on next year, don't forget Necrocosm is his next full length film. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they're probably working on it right now if I had to guess. Yeah. But um, so the first one is called Lot 36. And Aaron, who, who'd you say the star was? Because he, he did a, an awesome job. Tim Blake Nelson from yeah. Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? and the Watchmen uh, sequel yeah, he's series. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. He's great. He's he, always he, great. He, was, he, he played, you know, a person that you love to hate, basically. And, yeah. uh, and he, he did it perfectly. And as the story unfolds, you, you know, you get more information on what's going on. It's uh, Lot 36 is a storage locker. You, do you ever see those reality shows where you can literally bid on a storage yeah. locker and sometimes there's some crazy stuff in there or sometimes there's just, you know, dirty clothes in there, whatever. So this is where this one starts. You know, there's people who bid on Lot 36 and uh, that character wins it. It's super, super good. Good payoff. Just love it. It was directed by Guillermo Navarro and the music was by uh, Tim Davies. Episode number two is called Graveyard Rats. That was directed by Vincencio Natali and music by Jeff Dana. Also great, and if you're claustrophobic, man, this is really going to hit you good. <laughs> Starts off with this uh, cemetery caretaker kind of out and about in the cemetery, and he comes across two like grave robbers. And it's set back in, you know, would you call it Victorian time, I guess, or something like that? I don't even know. Something way back, you know. And then the rest unfolds, and you get to see some mysterious and creepy stuff, man, for sure. It, that one kind of gets really wacky, actually. So I think you'll enjoy the ride. The next episode is The Autopsy, which was directed by David Pryor and uh, music by Christopher Young, who's done just a ton of stuff over the years. You can look them up on IMDb. This is one of the best ones, in my opinion. They're all great, but this one really brings it. Uh, absolutely creepy. You don't know where it's going. It's not apparent at all. It's wonderfully written and an excellent score. The next one was called The Outside, directed by Anna Lily Amapor and music by Daniel Lippi. This one is really kind of opposite of most of the ones, I think, in this series. It's, uh, it revolves around this magical skin cream, and it's supposed to be able to transform you. So the main character is very awkward, I guess, and not traditionally beautiful, how you, know, you might portray that in a film. She gets a Christmas gift of this lotion, and the rest unfolds from there, and you get to kind of see some zaniness and creepiness and uh definitely great with a, with a really good score as well the next one is of note uh it's called pickman's model and it's uh directed by keith thomas music by michael yurgensky and uh this one has crispin glover in it we haven't seen him in a while right he doesn't act in a lot of stuff right i dig him what's the last thing you can remember seeing crispin glover in um like charlie's angels or something Oh, I forgot he was in there. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's still like about 20 years ago. Or right. Something. Yeah, you just don't see him that often. And he's really good. Yeah. And he's good in this one too. Um, this one is a little bit more, I would say, of like a slow burn. It really makes you earn it. Most of these are set, um, you know, back in that Victorian time, you know, no cars, et cetera, et cetera. Creepy though. Um, they do some really cool special effects with some paintings you, that, that you'll see. That's, it's very, very cool. And th th actually with all these, there's a little bit of in each one where there's kind of stuff that you really kind of haven't seen before, or it's a little bit just different enough to, to make you uh, notice it and uh, have you know, a harder punch when they deliver it. Episode number six is Dreams in the Witch House, and this one was really cool. It starts out with a uh, young brother and sister, their, their twin brother and sister, and uh, the, the little girl passes away. It seems like she's sick or something like that. And uh, you see her get sucked into a vortex, and um, the, the rest of the story happens. A lot of twists and turns, some definite spookiness and great effects in this one. Also great music. Every single one of these ones have an outstanding score to them, and you know, as Voyager 3, we care about that probably more than your average folk, right? Yeah. <laughs> then number seven, 
was the one that, as we talked about earlier, we were looking forward to probably the most is the viewing by Panos Cosmatos. And the music is really excellent by Daniel Lopatin. Um, I had to look him up because I didn't know him at all. So I, uh, I, I, I looked on YouTube and he's been doing some synth music for quite a long time. Um, he's from Brooklyn, New York, and a uh, really talented guy. Excellent music. If you know Panos Cosmatos and you know what he delivers in his films, the, uh, the vibe and the uh, cinematography and the colors and just the textures of, of, of what he shoots, this delivers in spades. You're going to love it. It's, it's more of what he does. The story's great. Great payoffs. Can't recommend it enough. I think it's probably my favorite episode of the series. And then episode number eight is called The Murmuring, directed by Jennifer Kent. And the music is by Jed Kurzel. And I didn't see this one yet, so I can't comment on it. But I don't see why it wouldn't be awesome as well. So this is all on Netflix. Every single one, all eight of the episodes are out. So I can't recommend this enough. This is the perfect time of year to go check out something like this. But, you know, for, for folks like us, we, we watch this stuff 24 through 65, right? <laughs> yeah. didn't, uh, didn't Jed Kurzel do uh, Alien Covenant? I'm not sure. I'll have to look that Help up. Help me out, Aaron. Composed by Jed Kurzel. It was released on May 19, 2017 through Milan Records and Fox Music. Oh, Alien yep, Covenant. Yep, I see it. Yep, I just didn't look up high enough. Score one for me. That's right. I love the style of the show. I love how Guillermo del Toro comes out and does a, a Rod Serling kind of thing where he talks to the audience and says, uh, you know, this is what this show is about. And this is what this episode is about. And yeah. um, sets, you know, he's wearing a suit and everything. It's like, it's that old fashioned anthology, you know, intro that uh, you don't see too much anymore. Of course, they don't make those kind of shows too much anymore. That's um, true. I thought this, this, you know, did its own, it does its own thing. And, and uh, it's great so far. I've only seen two episodes, but it's great. Yeah. Um, it, the the uh, little description, um, online like especially <clears throat> i saw it on imdb but it's probably in a lot of places but it says bizarre nightmares unfold in eight tales of terror in a visually stunning spine tingling horror collection curated by guillermo del toro that's nice yeah. isn't it yeah. that's that was expertly written whoever wrote that congratulations <laughs> yeah that guy that guy or girl earned their check on that that's right need that's them right. to write our bio right right and yeah. also one last thing panos call us <laughs> yeah, dude, right. you you need music, and we're the ones <laughs> to do it. Mailbag. So mailbag this week. There's three mentions. Three mentions. Uh, uh, some of our buddies, Metal Dan. He talked about when we were talking about when we mentioned the um, disappointing movies, right? Personally disappointing movies. He mentioned Hellboy, hmm. uh, the reboot, the reboot of Hellboy with David Harbour and uh, directed by Neil Marshall. Neil Marshall's done some really cool stuff like, you know, like Doomsday and the, the Descent. Um, so, you know, and David Harbour is great. Uh, he was expecting greatness out of this movie. And so was I. Uh, I remember seeing an image of David Harbour as Hellboy and he looked amazing. Um, Ron Perlman was the man for, for Hellboy, but it was cool to see David Harbour give it a, give it a shot. But then the movie didn't turn out to be anything good at all. And Dan has like, I don't know, two or three Hellboy tattoos, I think. So yeah, that's imagine how disappointed he was personally with that movie. Um, and it pretty much killed the franchise too, is what Dan said. And it's true. Uh, they're not going to make an, try to make another Hellboy movie after that one just ran it into the ground. But you know, that's a common thing. Like people running, franchises into the ground like they, they did they can't help it at a certain point but um also joe katie mentioned his disappointing movie is the hobbit which i very much agree with you know you have the lord of the rings it's one of the best trilogies of all time and then uh they just <laughs> come up with the hobbit it's yeah. just horrible it's almost unwatchable man like, like what was up horrible. with the uh the real Pretty time horrible. dinner scene like yeah, no, no about, editing. This is real a time. Hour, about forty <laughs> minutes. They yeah, sing I mean, like we, three songs. I mean, yeah. we edit this show. You know what I mean? Like, yep. yeah, come on. You, you can, gotta you edit. Can, you got. I mean, if they're having dinner, you can't show dinner. 
the whole no, thing. Potatoes and everything. In but the they cooking. did, and they showed them doing the dishes and everything, if I remember, right? <laughs> Throwing the plates do, and singing. Just They're like, what about that? You got, time to, you got time to put that in an adventure story? You're <laughs> fucking up, man. That's right. You know? Um, so The Hobbit, I very much agree with him. Um, and Trembling Colors talked to us again. He was talking about the disappointment he had with Alien Resurrection also. And he said, if you're looking for, you know, scientists tampering with aliens and trying to control them, but done in a good way, um, look to the Dark Horse series of Aliens Rogue and Alien Labyrinth. You know, and a lot of uh, Dark Horse did so many alien books and predator books, too. A lot of times you get more sort of dedication, care, craft and, and everything when it comes to comic books and, and just books in general than the movies that are that can sometimes just be a cash grab. So thanks to those guys for uh, for participating in the in the correspondence with the band. Yes, in the discussion. Mailbag. All right, we have some Voyager 3 news to talk about. The biggest and most fun one that we have to cover tonight is we're going to reveal the song that we're doing for the Scored to Death, The Dark Art of Scary Movie Music documentary companion album. Us, along with um, Alan Haworth, Steve Moore from Zombie, and a whole host of other excellent uh, film composers are doing... Icons. Icons, yes, are doing... Uh, cover versions of different famous horror themes throughout the years. So earlier this week, Steve Moore revealed the song that he's working on, and it's the uh, theme to Stepfather 2. So uh, we decided as well. Solid. Solid, solid choice. Solid choice. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to put together our own arrangement to Phantasm. Um, mm -hmm. it's gonna take, we're going to take a little piece of this, a little piece here, a little piece there, and put together a nice little arrangement of that iconic score by Fred Myro and Malcolm Seagrave. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Where are all our phantasm people? Let's hear it. You know, I got a soft spot for phantasm. Why is that? Because it scared the piss out of you when you were well, seven you, years old? You guys know how much I like Entombed, the band yeah. Entombed. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, they, a uh, Easter, it's a they little Easter egg. That. Very heavy version. I remember that. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah, so yeah, so that is on the companion album to the documentary film that's on Kickstarter right now. So we're going to put a link in the description for that Kickstarter. Um, it has a few days left, and they're trying to hit that goal to make that documentary film as good as it can be. And um, everybody's going to be looking forward to the companion album of all the cover versions of classic horror themes. And the last piece of information that we have for you is that New York Ninja sequel comic book hit stands on November 30th. So make sure you order your copy from your favorite comic book shop. And in celebration of that, on Saturday, December 3rd at Comics and More in Madison Heights, Michigan, we are playing a free concert where we're going to play some songs from the New York Ninja score and all of our other albums. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Come on out and hang out with us. I think doors are at uh, 4 o'clock, or the showtime is at 4 o'clock. We'll put it in the description. All right, another fun topic we wanted to cover is 20-year anniversary of films. What's your favorite one that holds up? And what's one that either you didn't like it at the time, or you saw it then, and when you've seen it more recently, it was like, eh, that didn't hold up so good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so films from 20 years ago. I was yeah. surprised that so many great movies came out in that year. So I really had to force myself to whittle it down to one instead of giving like five picks or something. So, right. Um, who's going first? Greg, man, you're going to make the guy who did the least amount of research <laughs> go first. <laughs> All right. You, you've seen lots of movies in your life. You've researched this topic very thoroughly. That's right. All right. So my, my pick is signs. I will contend that Signs has one of, still has one of the creepiest scenes in a movie that I've seen. Yes. Uh, you know, when the, the children are gathered and they're looking out the window and apparently it was like filmed by somebody who sent it into the news station. And it just reminded me of like, you know, like the way our world is now, everything is viral. And it, it was like the perfect viral video. And then you see that alien step out from behind the hedge. 
yeah. and they like pause on it and it's blurry and <laughs> I that whole scene was done so well. I mean the whole movie was done well. Yes. But so my pick is signs. I still think it's creepy. I think it holds up. I think all those things that are in Steve's criteria, but here's my twist on it. I don't like it because of Mel Gibson. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, man. That's, yeah. that's a good point. No, so you kind of get both I, in one. It's Yeah, it's my pick, but I hate it because of him. <laughs> yeah, that, I've struggled with that because Mad the Mad Max movies are three of my favorite movies of all time, and I don't know how to feel about that post uh, yeah. Mel Gibson, man. I don't know. I know. I know. Yeah, so that, but, that's, how I'm, that's how I'm copping out of doing... <laughs> no, that, that's interesting and clever so good on you man <laughs> yeah. see aaron aaron steve said interesting and clever well, you're right you're right i'm sorry i doubted you it was just your presentation <laughs> in the beginning it was a little yeah awkward. it was rough i was struggling <laughs> all right aaron what all do you right. have for 20 year um, film okay so i i really had to work to narrow it down because i really love a lot of movies that came out that year and i was even gonna um I was going to like kind of almost flip a coin right at game time right now um, to decide what I was going to say, but I guess I'll stick with this because you really can't go wrong. Uh, the two towers, the uh, mm. Lord of the Rings part two, that was mind blowing, you know, uh, the fight, the big battle scenes and everything. And the, the, just the doom and gloom drama, the um, stacking all these odds against these characters who are so small in such a big world. And they're just struggling <laughs> They're suffering constantly yeah. through the whole trilogy, but um, maybe the most in that movie, uh, it's so bleak. And I love that. I love bleak. Empire Strikes Back is bleak. And a lot of times the second movie of a trilogy is, is the darkest. So anyway, that is my one. It holds up beautifully. Um, but <laughs> I don't know if we're going to overlap on this. My, uh, my one that doesn't hold up, it, to me, is maybe the ultimate, especially from that year. Um, this and its partner are the ultimate didn't hold up. And we already talked about this, so I won't go on because we beat up on the prequels a lot. But <laughs> Attack of the Clones, um, you know, when I saw that, I was so hyped up. And then a few years later, I, you know, I saw it several times in the theater, loved it, like sort of forced myself to love it. And then a few years later, I went to watch it in preparation for um, episode three. And I said, what happened? This is not <laughs> how I remember it. So that's the same thing that happened with me with Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones didn't hold up, doesn't really now at all, and certainly didn't even back um, a few years after it came out. So that, those are my uh, those are my picks. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait till Steve goes and I'm going to give an honorable mention. Okay. There you go. Greg's good for the s- honorable mentions. <laughs> <laughs> I am, but that's I right. got one. As both you guys have said, you know, obviously in any given year, there's tons of movies. So I, I kind of shed the stress of trying to be like, well, is this one worthy of being picked, you know, type of thing? Is, is this really my favorite one? And I'm like, nah, is, it, is it just one that I liked in that year or, or one of the top ones that I liked? Was it very mentionable and, or of note, right? So that's how yeah. I did it. So I wasn't, you know, really freaking, I guess, about trying to pick the one. So I picked Dog Soldiers, which is funny. You mentioned Neil Marshall earlier, yeah. Aaron. is directed by Neil Marshall, music by Mark Thomas. As you said before, The Descent, Doomsday, and a handful oh, yeah. of other great movies. But uh, Dog Soldiers came out in, in 2002. And uh, I remember seeing it. Uh, Aaron, you and I may have watched it together. I can't quite yeah. remember. But uh, it was great because right at that time, well, first I'll just tell you it was a great film because it was written great, edited great. Uh, just put together really well. Um, very entertaining, high stakes, uh, a little reminiscent, I would say, of Night of the Living Dead in a way, with some of the what way the structure was put together and how they were, where they were, and uh, trying to fortify, you know, similar kind of stuff to that. So that's the main reason why it was great. But there's another sideline reason why it was great is because right around that time, so many movies were relying so much on CGI all the time. It was almost like a crutch. It was, I mean, I get it. It's a it's probably cheaper, faster way to do a lot of stuff that you don't have to make sets for and, and costume design. I understand the production aspect of it, but if it's not done right, you immediately know that it's a fake thing standing there in the scene and the actors may or may not even be looking at it straight on correctly. You know, all that stuff that started to plague 
films around that time. So Dog Soldiers <clears throat> is a film that is all practical effects. It's all costumes. It's people. It's, you know, actors and stuntmen in the werewolf costumes. And everything is done for real. And it really grounds that film to me and makes it more believable and just more classic and holds up all those things. You know, if you see, if you see bad CGI and you see, you see it later on, you're like, Oh my God, this just takes you right out of it. Yeah. It's so, like the um, Scorpion King. Yeah. That would be a good one to mention. Cause I think that's this year. I'm pretty sure that one is like really the worst bad. CGI. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that one's sort of known for having the worst CGI. Right. Yeah. Right, for sure. Like they did it quick or they ran out of money. I don't know what oh it was. God. Something. Because he of like that era, up, he, there was good CGI. You know what I right. mean? So I don't know what happened. Yeah, when he when the rock is like I don't know what he turns into, but he comes out of that like hole or something and it's just awful CGI. Yeah. Anyways, I digress. I don't right mean. on. My um pick of a film that does not hold up. Unfortunately we have a double, Aaron and yeah. I picked the pack of the clones. But I, that's okay, man. That's okay. Yeah. I figured we would. Yeah. Yeah, you but know, we don't, all of us had that, that 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 thing going on where when we were in the theaters at the time, we thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. But then <clears throat> there was a if you could if you could see it on a graph, there's an exponential drop as time went on. It kept dropping, and you start to realize, man, what they do? What? Wait, wait, what? What's going on? You know, that's kind of for us what happened to the prequels mainly. But yeah. Revenge of the Sith was pretty darn good. Yeah, and uh, the best of the three. Um, well, that's the only one he had ideas for. Everything else was fluffing it out and yeah, and, and stretching it, you know. And and if he had just gone in and had some balls and said, "I'm going to make a prequel movie," and put every great idea I ever had into it, everybody would have been happy, you know. Yeah. You don't have to start with the dude being seven years old. That's not compelling. Nobody right. cares about that. So, huh. yeah. Aaron, Aaron spitting truth and fire. <laughs> you know what's funny is I've never seen Dog Soldiers, but it's been on like my my wish list forever, and uh, yeah. nobody nobody streams that movie. Huh. I don't know what it is. I cannot find it anywhere. So oh, that's weird. If anybody I, I have a DVD to this podcast knows where to find it streaming. Please put it in the comments. Oh, uh, Greg, what's your honorable mention? Oh, and I think you guys will agree. Uh, Road to Perdition. Oh God, yes, yes. Uh, I don't know if I saw that. Uh, Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks. Oh, it's yeah. It's like a I gangster did. movie. I did not Holy see cow, that. man. It's so it. good. All right. Our final topic of this Halloween episode of V3Cast is going to be switching back to music. We haven't talked about music in a minute. So, we all have favorite albums of any genre, any time, uh, band, solo artist, whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever uh, album that totally made you go, oh my God, this is one of my favorite records ever. So what we want to know is, what's the most disappointing follow-up to your favorite record? We promise that like, we're, we're going to take give a break on the disappointing stuff and the, uh, the letdown stuff with movies and music. Like Next, next episode, we won't, won't be talking about any of that. Yeah, but can for we some get reason, back to positivity? What happened to this? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, for some reason, we're traveling the dark road, maybe because our thoughts <laughs> grow darker, uh, during Halloween time. That's right. Um, That's right. Uh, who, who's going first? Uh, I'll go first on this one, if you don't yeah. mind. I already know Steve's album. Really? Disappointment? Uh, the, the Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. I was so very disappointed with One Hot Minute by the Red Hot Chili Peppers because, oh, yeah. because uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. I mean... <laughs> I'm not even a humongous Chili Peppers fan. I like them just fine, but Blood Sugar Sex Magic was was magic on al yeah. on album. Seriously, I mean that's it's a one of the wonderful. It's one record. of the best one of the best albums ever recorded, in my opinion. Yeah, man. So, you know, can you imagine the follow up? You're like, what are they gonna do now? I did know that John Frusante either got fired or quit, and Dave Navarro stepped in to play guitar. And I love Jane's Addiction as well. It just so happened to be that, it, you know, in my opinion, that style of guitar playing didn't lend itself to what I guess I wanted to hear on no. Chili Peppers' record. I wanted to hear more of the funk stuff and cleaner guitar, strat, not overdriven stuff like rock stuff, I guess. You know, so that one hot minute was so disappointing to me. Dave Navarro made no effort to fit into the band music-wise. He didn't care about that. He wanted to stand out. 
So yeah, he, I guess maybe he was like, well, I'm I'm my brand or something. Mm -hmm. I'm what I do. This is what I do. I guess I don't. I'm yep. kind of speculating, but oh, I agree that that's uh, a, a, it was a huge disappointment. I mean, they have always made. Um, I mean, once John Frusciante joined the band, anytime he left, they were never as good. Um, yeah. Now before before he was in the band, they were. I, th I think they were still great. But he brought a guitar presence to the band that uh, no one else has. Um, yeah. And who, so, who was the guitar player on Mother's Milk? Was that for Shante no, that was as him. well? That it was. was. Okay, was I couldn't problem. remember when he came yeah, in. And, and, and Mother's Milk is the best record. So I don't even. Know I love that album. Here. I do love that. Mother's album. Milk is great. It's great. Yeah, that's it's, the best one. It's beautiful. Um, that, I have. That's spoken. my sweet spot with them. I'd say is Mother's Milk and Blood Sugar, and for and for <laughs> me, Blood Sugar is like the pinnacle. Um. You go. Want to go, Greg? Yeah, I'll go because I definitely picked a record that nobody in their right mind would defend. So <laughs> it, sh it should be a uh, should be an interesting conversation. So I picked Fraley's Comet. It's the first solo album from Ace Fraley. Yeah, and uh, he so he ended up getting this guy Todd Howard to play guitar and sing. So like Ace Fraley only sings like half the songs maybe and then todd howard sings the other half and uh he got anton fig to play drums hmm. and then uh this guy john regan played bass but uh it doesn't matter the important thing is this record is criminally underrated so it falls into that conversation we had <laughs> like i don't know what podcast that was but we talked about underrated records this one's definitely underrated especially for those of us that are kiss fans which you know obviously i count myself in that number but uh there was a summer that i got this record and i listened to it so many times and eddie kramer produced it so it was produced great it's only 41 minutes every song is good and uh it's exactly what you would have wanted for ace fraley but then he came out with the next one and i think all they really did was get a different drummer but like man that second one it was called second sighting just <laughs> not even not even close. Yeah, missed the mark, eh? So, I don't know. Like, maybe part of the reason I brought this one up is because I'm going to see Ace Fraley mm -hmm. next month. Right. Well, hey, or, you, you or can or ask him, that. hey, what were you thinking? <laughs> but, man, I'll tell you what. I hope he's playing a bunch of Fraley's comments stuff. He does, I doesn't argue. he? I, I think he does. Does he sprinkle some he of that in? I'm sure he'll play Rock Soldiers. Oh, yeah, that song for sure. But, like... um, there's so many other good ones on that one. Like, uh, so I think Todd Howarth was in a band called like 707 and, um, they ended up like using some of his songs on the Fraley's Comet record. And then just like, I don't know, changing a few minor things, but essentially like using the same songs, <laughs> you know, that's my pick. And I just, I picked a weird one just because I knew nobody would expect that one. <laughs> uh, my pick is, it's not even so much that it's bad, but it's as a follow up, it is just not, it doesn't cut it. So, and also it's, it tells a story about the implosion of a band. So you got, you know, uh, Appetite for Destruction, which I think most people would agree is one of the best rock albums of all time. Um, that, that, that band came shot out of a cannon and they took over the world. Yeah. And they just put everybody's dick in the dirt. You know, every band they were competing <laughs> with, you know, uh, they just shut down, you know, um, the, the, the MTV music scene, you know, everybody, all the poisons and Bon Jovi's had to just take a break, you know? Yeah. And so when Guns N' Roses came out with that, they changed everything. And if they had come out, you know, with us, with another album like that, or maybe another seven albums like that, everybody would be, telling this grand story of the history of guns and roses instead they screwed around for a few years they did an ep that huh. doesn't count as a follow-up it was mostly live it's pretty good though it's cool but it's not like a real real album it was covers and live stuff right and what one two originals i think then they they wasted more time and axel rose lost his mind had to be so gr over the top and grandiose and they came out with a double album for their second actual album, a double album. And hey, we, no we did that too. <laughs> no, no, that I wasn't was, going to say it, Steve. I don't know. I wasn't going to say it. 
<laughs> Ours is a double LP, but it's only how many minutes? Mm, 57 ish. It's a regular length album. Theirs is two and a half hours altogether. Oh That's God, a double, yeah. double, double album. So it's a little, it's a way too ambitious. Um, and of course, there are good songs on it, you know, but um, they don't, for the most part, they don't. Like when I hear November Rain or Don't Cry, I don't get hyped up like I do with anything from Appetite for Destruction. Uh, you Could Be Mine is, is, is great. But overall, you know, I, I've always thought, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to like really explore this to like just make like an edited together playlist from that, from those, uh, from those albums and put together like one solid album and see if that would work. Right. But uh, as, a, as a follow up, it, it was a huge disappointment. And then it just basically killed the band because they, you know, they went, they toured and everything, of course, but they, they couldn't stand each other um, during the making of that album and afterwards. And they, uh, you know, I've read about that they were barely ever in the studio together and all that stuff. And they just, they just lost their way, dude. And, uh, but the, the, the razor sharp edge of Appetite for Destruction, it was impossible to follow up. So that's yeah. my pick. You know what the thing about it was is like you wanted to believe that like the five of them were like this group of guys that were like best friends and playing yeah. clubs and you know what I mean like you wanted to believe that like get, getting getting in the getting in the bar fights against other guys and stuff yeah <laughs> and and they all they all looked the part right so I think where it went off the tracks is like you you know, first of all, you lost the drummer, Steven Adler. So he, you know, obviously had drug problems or whatever it was that was going on. So they get rid of him and they get a hired gun. Yeah. Now Axl Rose is playing a piano and right. like there's an orchestra and like, you know, I just wanted the gritty like LA like club band that might stab you. You know right, what I mean? And right. like they definitely lost that like whole thing on the second record yeah so like that, i feel yeah. like yeah we got to work your way into that i think floyd didn't put the wall out for their second album they 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 waited people get that taste of fame man and Groovy, there you man. Go. so yeah that's a nice little pick of records that just didn't hit us right back in the day um so let us know what you guys think um about cabinet of curiosities if you've watched it uh let us know your favorite episode or episodes um let us know what your uh, favorite 20-year-old movies are or ones that you did not like or didn't hold up to you. And then let us know what your favorite follow-up to a humongously successful record was in the comments, and uh, we'll get a dialogue going. And in the meantime, go out there and get some candy uh, in your pillowcases and uh, yeah, be safe. Have a good Halloween. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. And until next time, this has been V3Cast. <laughs>